most of the large high profile NGOs uh, are basically uh, tools of the people who fund them. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that is being recorded on the 29th of April, 2016. And today we're joined on the line by Patrick Henningsen of 21st Century Wire. I hope that all of my listeners will already be familiar with Patrick and his work, but if not, please go to 21stCenturyWire.com, link in the show notes to check out some of that work. Today, specifically, we're going to be talking about a very important, very extensive and extensively researched article that he's recently written called An Introduction, Smart Power and the Human Rights Industrial Complex. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Good to be with you, James. Let's get into this article, which is, as I say, very expansive and very detailed. And so maybe to get a handle on this, let's just start by defining this human rights industrial complex that you identify. What are the moving parts involved here and how do they relate together? Um, It's kind of, I can narrow it down to human rights because I think that's an issue that a lot of people can uh, relate with. Um, it's actually bigger than, let's say, the human rights uh, charities, for instance. These are some of the organizations that I discussed in this paper, uh, which we published a, a couple of months ago. Now, um, I think h- human rights is key here because if you think about the trend in interventionism and interventionist foreign policy over the last uh, 20 years, uh, one of the main devices, the main tools in order to get the public on side uh, with a humanitarian intervention, for instance, is the human rights issue. So this can be expanded out into uh, feminism, international feminism. It it can be expanded into weapons of mass destruction, uh, torture by uh, said regimes uh, that are unfavorable uh, for the Western powers, for instance. People are all familiar with this. Now, it's taken on a whole new dimension in the last few years, and part of this is powered by the Internet. It's powered by uh, web-based and social media applications. And some of the leading organizations in there are, you can trace them back to the usual suspects who we are familiar with, like George Soros, the Open Society Foundation, Freedom House, and many, many others, and also Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and so forth. And I'm, I'm focusing on, on the charities because I think this is, in my opinion, uh, quite a cynical uh, uh, use of these human rights charities because in the end, I have to be clear, I support NGOs. I think there's a role for NGOs around the world. I, I know a lot of people who work in NGOs and for the most part, these are good people. Uh, they're hardworking and they well-meaning and they're dedicated to their mission. And uh, however, uh, most of the large high-profile NGOs uh, are basically uh, tools of the people who fund them, uh, be they governments in terms of the United States directly funds a number of these uh, NGOs and through George Soros, uh, Wall Street billions of funds, tranche funds. So uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, uh, Avaz, a uh, number of these organizations, 38 Degrees, I could go on and on. These are all big society, uh, social entrepreneur uh, businesses and applications through charities and so forth. So, uh, And these also have big corporate donors. Many of these happen to be the beneficiaries of the foreign policy interventionism. There is a revolving door between uh, human rights charities, Washington State Department, uh, and also a number of other these sort of third sector organizations. So there are people working through all of these uh, organizations. So um, that's my main point. Um, well, let's let's look at a specific example so that we can get people on board with, with what we're talking about here. And I wanted to look at this Suzanne Nossel character that you point out in this article, who I think not only in terms of what she advocates, for example, in an article that she wrote for Foreign Affairs back in 2004 called Smart Power that we'll uh, link to in the show notes, but also just in her biography itself. Her biography is kind of a living, breathing example of what you're talking about here, the nexus of State Department and and uh, charity. So let's talk a little bit about Suzanne. So, so if, you, if you know, if you're familiar with the term soft power, 
Um, soft power, if in its proper definition, uh, would refer to, I would I would say would refer to media uh, coverage and using the media in order to uh, create uh, perception management. Okay, and you could extend this to English language media, Voice of America, uh, Radio Free Europe, and these are examples of examples of soft power in its early stages. It developed, however, into something much more uh, complex and much more digital. And uh, to take that to a new level, soft power has been uh, reformed into smart power. The uh, inventor of that term i believe it's susan nocell is is the person who really originally coined that term and put some weight to it and uh her she's got a very interesting background she's a high-powered public relations professional so she's worked for um it, it, it right from the state department went straight into the head position at amnesty uh international U, in the u.s amnesty america and at the very same time amnesty is running public relations advertising campaigns about nato uh no fly zones in syria russia needs to stop sending arms to Assad, etc. But her background with uh, Human Rights Watch, another Soros-funded uh, charity, and also McKinsey uh, and Company, famous law firm with with great connections to to the deep state. So she's very uh, talented, uh, but she's also a PR professional. And I think this is the main point: is that per- in the 21st century, perception management is everything. Because although we all might agree that the governments have uh, incredible power and military uh, has overwhelming force uh, in the United States and NATO, they still need uh, the public to have some backing. They call it the bottom 51% is is how some people might refer to this in the super bureaucratic class. So if they can take care of the bottom 51%, then this greases the, the, the tracks as it were for any kind of intervention or the construction of a shadow state in a place like Syria or parallel government structures in Libya and Syria and all in the name of humanitarian intervention. So Suzanne Nocell is a, was a key player um, and a, but also just a good example of the revolving door between the State Department, the human rights industry, I'll call it industry because it's a billion dollar industry, um, and also uh, other of these charities and third sector uh, organizations. So she's only a, a perfect example of that, although I don't think she's uh, in a fantastic steering position at the moment. Um, she's she cycled out of uh, some of these organizations into a new organization now, but it's a good example. So essentially what we're talking about here is a psychological operation that is waged against the public in order to get them on board with these uh, aggressive interventions in various places around the world. And this, I mean, we've seen this play out so many times by now from the former Yugoslavia to Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. Uh, We've seen the same narrative rolled out over and over, but I think one that obviously is still at the forefront of, uh, of the news headlines these days is what's happening in Syria. Let's talk a little bit about the Syrian narrative and how that was developed by these types of organizations working in concert with the State Department and the Pentagon. Sure. Um, the, the, we're all familiar with the no-fly zone uh, as a concept. And uh, in Syria, the no-fly zone was rebranded. It was tweaked somewhat uh, to uh, call the safe zone. So this is a common uh, lexicon used by all the sort of media heads and experts and politicians in the State Department. So the creation of a first was a no-fly zone, then a safe zone. These third sector organizations and online uh, websites like Avaz uh, have launched all these polling campaigns, and it's it's kind of to get young people and millennials engaged in the issue. And the earliest real good example of this was Coney 2012, a couple of years ago, where they actually got you know, U.S. school children to empty their piggy banks out to uh, help to get the idea of uh, in, uh, military intervention deployment in Uganda at the front of the White House's and the State Department's priority list. And it was really a PR exercise because th- that agenda was already in play with AFRICOM. But it, what it, it's it's about perception management. So in Syria, this is Syria is basically the most multifaceted, multi-layered operation ever. Okay, so it's got five sides and three layers, and any way you turn it, you'll see a different third sector organization. So there is the construction of all of this consensus building uh, around the edges, 
and then there is the actual penetration. In other words, where the where the soft, soft power and the smart power becomes uh, hard power on the ground, not in the military sense, but literally building. It's not a shadow state. It's more like a prosthesis. They're building parallel uh, parts of what they what might call in Britain the big society. And these are through organizations that have already been and methods that have been road tested uh, in the West already in Britain and America through leadership training, leadership councils, through organizations like Common Purpose in Britain. These are international third sector NGOs. And so they've taken this technology and been able to weaponize aspects of it to create the Syrian civil defense, for instance, the white helmets in Syria. That is basically it's it's masquerading as a first responder organization, but it's funded to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and what they're doing is basically constructing a kind of p parallel organizations that are embedded inside Syria to basically guarantee, in my mind anyway, either it's a, a militia in waiting uh, or it's a stay behind intelligence operation or whatever it is. It's a good example of uh, well funded by the EU, by the British Foreign Office, by USAID as well. So these are all these organizations that you and many others will be familiar with that are putting a lot of uh, resources into constructing these prosthetic um, social uh, organizations in places like Syria. But to do this, you need to ramp up the uh, uh, public relations campaign. So Starvation in Madaya was a big uh, PR campaign before Christmas. That was completely mischaracterized by the Western media, by the BBC, by all of the mainstream media outlets in the West – totally jump on board. They don't check any of the facts. Uh, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is another example, uh, quoted by the UN, the darling of the Guardian. Uh, the State Department even quotes them. They're now quoting, you know, and basically promoting the white helmets, Syrian civil defense. It's a similar sort of thing. Um, Bellingcat is another example. This is a Atlantic Council linked, NATO linked blogger, which is meant to look like it's an independent uh, open source intelligence blog, but really it's absolutely embedded right in there with to, to basically put uh, Bellingcat's interesting because they this uh, Elliot Higgins, I think his name is so they, he, he it's it was meant to look like crowdfunding started this and it was just this innocent guy in his bedroom searching for the truth. And he put forward the idea that the Assad government in 20. 13 in August, launched sarin gas attacks against his own people. He was one of the first people to see that idea. And then MH17, that, that Russia or Russian rebels had some, somehow shot down MH17 just for, for kicks. And then Bellingcat, this blog, basically says that Russia is not targeting any ISIS targets. This was this talking point. And if you look at all of these cascade across the media, so they use the blogs or the this the sort of facade of an independent media as the, the mainstream media uses that as a source to then cascade through right up to, to the government level. It's a very clever and very well designed system. However, when, over time, it sort of collapses on itself because uh, the facts don't match up. This idea of open source intelligence that John Kerry and others uh, use time and time again, along with these internet polling campaigns and third sector uh, uh, PR campaigns by, by purpose, they don't match up with the facts on the ground. Eventually, it collapses because you can't fabricate real events. And this is the problem that they run into. But it's they seem to want to push the – as long as they can push the agenda and keep it moving steadily in one direction, they don't really care about anything that's going to be debunked further along in the timeline. So it's just – to me, it's, uh, it is a kind of radical pragmatism for the millennial generation. So this is the, this is where neoconservatism and this sort of hard power has now morphed into smart power, and and this is what we see. So it's it's designed to penetrate the uh, public perception and to it's the outsourcing of consensus building, essentially, is what it is. Well, yes, and it's interesting how sources like Bellingcat will end up being quoted in the mainstream media, but somehow or other, the open source intelligence of uh, 21st Century Wire or Corbett Report, somehow that doesn't quite get into the media. I wonder how that works. No, no, 
No, and the, you know, and we we published a lot of stories about the white helmets, and um, I have sent those to mainstream journalists and gotten no reply at all. So I, to me, it's a scoop waiting to happen, and it's up to them whether they want to run with it. But you know, we'll continue to uh, just put the facts together. And, you know, put the story together and put it out. Uh, there's not a lot you can do at this point. But I think it's interesting. Um, you, you have touched on a point there. I, I think there is a kind of uh, in the mainstream media, especially in the West, specifically in North America, Europe is a little more there's a little more leeway in, in countries like Germany and in and even the UK, although it is heavily controlled in America. It, it is absolutely repressive the environment in the press if you and i found this is interesting james because uh in the immediate aftermath of the iraq war um there was this kind of open rebellion against the bush administration uh where and i'm a child of that time basically you know i came out of that <laughs> that cauldron basically uh where people were very angry knew that they had been lied to and were openly challenging the state and the agenda and the people and the individuals basically and and it changed under barack obama and i think libya was a big turning point where the media completely got on side uh and it literally closed ranks in a way that we're still seeing now with syria and in the face of all the facts in the face of all the lies from one false flag plot to the next to one fake uh, you know, charity organization to the next to funding uh, Al Nusra Front, arming Al Qaeda in Syria. The, the the media has closed ranks and they will not challenge the state agenda. Abs and if they do, it's very late in the game after there's no policy effect. So in other words, they'll wait three years. So this is this was this was the result of the Libyan project. I think this is where the change started happening from. You know, so the last dinosaurs of the Bush era of of um, protest, you know, the John Pilgers of the world and these big mainstream media guys that they're, they're still challenging that. But it's um, I think, to, to be honest, James, I think the the methods employed by the state, by the shadow state, by these parallel organizations are getting so complicated and the subterfuge is so deep and multi-layered that most mainstream media journalists are unable to track it, if, unless you've been on it from the beginning. And I know that people like you and others who have studied hard power or have studied coercion, like through Gladio and things like this, you you know, you're, nothing surprises you. You know that the, the, the depths the state will go to, to ram through an agenda, be it military or geopolitical. So you're already open to these ideas. And I think there are a lot of people in mainstream media, newspapers and especially broadcast journalists, they're not open at all to that because they haven't studied um, some of those things uh, in recent history. So, but the information's there. It's absolutely there. Anybody can go research it. We don't have any spe special access uh, to anything that, that other people don't have just by looking at social media and basic reports out of the Middle East. On the note of the Syria civil defense units, the white helmets that you were talking about, there was an interesting story that played out this past week where um, Raid Saleh, the head of the organization, was on his way to Washington to accept an award, an, a humanitarian award from InterAction, an NGO based in Washington, D.C., and he was actually prevented from entering the States. He, his visa was revoked and he was told to go back where he came from, according to press reports. What happened there? Is the, is the State Department uh, getting rid of the white helmets or what's going on? <laughs> well, I think uh, I was watching the, the press conference from yesterday and Mark Toner, uh, one of the State Department spokespeople, uh, was you know, caught off guard, basically caught on the back foot on this question when it was posed to him by uh, Matthew Lee from the Associated Press. And the uh, Salah, the leader of the white helmets, their sort of public face, if you will, um, the reports are that he he has links to extremist organizations. Now we know from our research that that's Al Nusra Front, is, is basically, and so I think it's possible that uh, the uh, the American contingent uh, either were caught off guard on this issue, and uh, they had to do a quick uh, U-turn. For, this guy had to basically they had to send him back essentially. So I I don't know. They're they're putting a USAID has pumped about twenty three million into the white helmets. Uh, 
And so the, you know, the America has a big investment. Britain has potentially a bigger investment in that. In fact, the White Helmets were founded by James uh, Le Miserier, who is a graduate of Sandhurst, a top NATO military mind. Okay, so uh, we're meant to believe that he just wanted to start a first responders organization, teach them how to, you know, rescue f- people from the rubble. They claim they've saved 40,000 lives from Assad's or an ISIS brutality. I-, I personally don't know where they get these numbers, and I would tend to think any numbers coming out of Syria, from my experience with the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, is that they're not going to be very accurate at all. In, in fact, they'll, most, m- m- they'll be fudged, inflated, misrepresented, and this is what I've found with the casualty numbers in the last five years in Syria as a whole. So I don't put a lot of uh, credibility in that in that 40,000. But yet the, the State Department has no problem bandying that that statistic around. All right. Well, let's finally then let's wrap this up by taking a look at what we have here. As we say, we have a psychological warfare that's being perpetrated against the people generally, in order to get them on board with these this war agenda and handing out Nobel Peace Prizes to these fake groups that are being supported by USAID and all the rest. What is the answer to this? What do we do to counteract this? I think part of the answer has to be just conversations like this, exposing these, um, these tools for what they are so that they can't be used in that way to generate support. But what about, as you say, all the all the well-meaning people that are caught up in organizations like this that truly believe that they're doing good and don't want to hear otherwise. How do we reach people like that? I, I, I think they're going to be uh, affected by these conversations. And, uh, you know, they talk about their bottom 51 percent that they need to basically shore up public opinion for. But we only need, I think, uh, in terms of uh, political awareness, I would say 1 percent or something like this will be enough for the idea to get around. In some countries right now, the NGO complex is basically dead. Uh, you know, in countries like Egypt, if you remember back in uh, late uh, 2011, they they raided like 17 uh, Western NGO offices, including uh, Freedom House and the National Democratic Institute, and uh, and actually brought charges, prosecuted a number of Western NGO workers, inclu- including Ray LaHood's uh, son, Sam LaHood, a uh, high-profile politician from the U.S. So uh, Russia basically listed George Soros's organizations as unfriendly. Uh, so a number of other countries like Hungary and are looking maybe more skeptically at uh, some of these organizations than they were before. Uh, so the game is, uh, in my opinion anyway, the game is up. It's definitely up in Syria. Uh, they're not going to tolerate uh, any of that sort of influence peddling uh, on that level. And uh, they do understand. I think the Syrians are, you got to give them a little more credit than they're given in the West in terms of their sophistication. Um, but they do understand and are aware of all these things. But uh, in terms of the West, my problem with this and the thing that's saddest is that people would be, you know, children would be donating money through Coney 2012 uh, campaigns, not knowing that they're basically playing a part in, uh, you know, military interventionism. And there's people who will also give money to a lot of organizations that, quite frankly, don't need it. Uh, or talented people going to work for organizations that are really just fronts. And, you know, USAID and the White Helmets are one in the same. They're both basically humanitarian fronts for a deeper uh, agenda, a deep state agenda. And so they're, they're both representations of each other in that respect. And this is ditto for the Brookings Institute and any of the think tanks that, that provide the policy backing and the sort of ideological backing for uh, these things that we see happening on the ground. So I think people are understanding this more and more now. And I think it's a question of time. And then they will morph the, have to morph this operation into something else. Uh, people are seeing the, the fake media as well. Foundation-funded media organizations are everywhere uh, on the right and the left. And I think people are becoming smart to this now. So it's a question of time. Uh, and the facts, you know, the, <laughs> you can't bury, you can't, you can't make up things and, and they can't stay uh, uh, up to scrutiny for a long period of time. This is the case with things like Bellingcat. They come, they play their role, and then they disappear. 
uh, because all their work is meaningless because it doesn't stand up to the test of time. And so th that's also something that will undermine this uh, in the long run. However, uh, if you've got money like George Soros and you're able to spread it around and he plays that sort of role of Goldfinger uh, th with these organizations, then th th it will continue. They'll change. They'll get more sophisticated. But I think the public are also getting more sophisticated. People in the developing world are getting smarter and they're identifying these things a lot faster and they're like, well, we don't need the National Endowment for Democracy to come into our African country and lecture us on something that we really know is just a Trojan horse for U.S. AFRICOM uh, in order to evict the Chinese or whatever the agenda is that year in Africa, for instance. So I think people even in those countries are becoming a lot more wiser uh, to these sort of programs. Well, hopefully that is the case. And hopefully, again, conversations like this will advance that, uh, that narrative. And for more of the detail and information, I'm going to direct people once again to this excellent detailed article. And if you have read it and you do enjoy it, I hope you'll spread it, uh, it out to others. It's called An Introduction, Smart Power and the Human Rights Industrial Complex. It's on 21st Century Wire. And of course, Patrick Hendrickson not only writes for them, he's also the host of Sunday Wire that I've been on a guest on a number of times in the past. So please check that out if you haven't yet done so. Patrick Henningson, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, James, very much. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.